It's January 1967. ABC has taken the country by storm with its campy version of Batman. Since imitation is the sincerest form of television, NBC and CBS were scrambling to come up with some kind of answer to Batman. So on January 9th, 1967, Americans tuned into CBS to see their answer. Half an hour later, we switched over to NBC to see what they came up with. Hi, I'm Irving. Welcome to the Dumbbell Derby. You heard right. Not only were both of these shows intended to be desperate imitations of Batman, they aired back to back for their entire run. So if Mr. Terrific didn't fill your stupid meter all the way up, you could change the channel and get a second dose. Captain Nice disappeared after 15 episodes. Mr. Terrific lasted two more. Once we got a good look at both of them, that was about what people expected. I was still 13, so I didn't really understand ratings and cancellations and things like that, but I knew both shows were really dumb and most people wouldn't watch them. It's such a burden being right all the time. They got some major players for the shows. Dick Gautier was a huge heartthrob at the time, and he played Mr. Terrific's best friend. The show also featured Paul Smith and John MacGyver as his handlers, both prominent figures in television at the time. Captain Nice was played by William Daniels, who would later voice Kit on Knight Rider and play Dr. Mark Craig on St. Elsewhere. Alice Ghostly played Carter's mother, and she was a household name. The shows didn't lack for talent. The problem was that talent didn't really have anywhere to go. Now, a little note about my sources for these two shows. Mr. Terrific got a DVD release in Germany. I managed to find a set for sale on the internet and bought it. The title is Immer wenn er Pillen nahm, which translates to Whenever He Takes the Pills. Somebody got paid to come up with that. Anyway, it includes the original English audio, so that wasn't a problem. Then I started looking around for Captain Nice. I found the DVD set in Italy. I ordered it and it arrived and I popped one into my computer and discovered there was no English option. They're only in Italian. I don't speak Italian. Back to the internet. More searching and I found a set of MP4 files somewhere, I don't even remember where now. They were in English at least, but the video was kind of fuzzy. So I thought I'd match the video from the DVDs to the audio from the MP4s. There was only one problem. It looks like both were rips from a VHS tape and the two tapes ran at slightly different speeds. I got the sound synchronized perfectly at the beginning, but as it went along the sound lagged further and further behind the audio until it was pretty clear what the problem was. The thing I discovered was the video on the DVDs was just as fuzzy as the others so I could just use the MP4s. So if anybody wants a set of Captain Nice DVDs in Italian, let me know. I'll make you a heck of a deal. The first episode of Captain Nice is an origin story, which makes sense. The short version is, Carter Nash is a sexually repressed mama's boy who invents a superpower potion, has to use it himself, and his mother makes him become a superhero. Mr. Terrific, on the other hand, dives right into his storyline. There's no need for an origin story because we get to hear it every freaking week in the opening song. A scientist, both wise and bold, set out to cure the common cold. Instead, he found this power pill, which he said most certainly will, turn a lamb into a lion. Like an eagle he'll be flying, solid steel will be like putty. It will work on anybody. But then twas found the potent pill made the strongest men quite ill. And so the secret search began to find the one and only man. Because it sure couldn't be a woman, now could it? Genetics just doesn't work like that. What they found made them squeamish. For only Stanley Beamish, a weak and droopy daffodil, could take the special power pill that sent him soaring through the skies, fighting foes and fighting spies. When he took the pill specific, it made him the most prolific, terrific, Immovenipilinam! Oops, I mean Mr. Terrific. You know what the embarrassing part is? I recited that from memory, from the first time I watched the show, 50 years ago. Three weeks in, everybody I knew was sick to death of that jingle and wished there was some way to skip past it to the show. You heard it here, folks. The Mr. Terrific theme song was directly responsible for the invention of the VCR. 
Stanley and his friend Hal own a gas station somewhere in northwestern Wyoming. I lived in that area for 10 years and never saw him. Anyway, we're introduced to how weak Stanley is. He's pinned to the ground by a car battery. Hal is hustling a woman, which is what he does best. Notice how easy it is for him to pick up the battery while Stanley can't even roll out from under it. The next car that pulls in contains Stanley's handlers, Mr. Reed and Mr. Trent. He's supposed to get on a train and get a super duper device from a Russian defector. But they don't tell him that. They tell him he's to do a pickup, they don't say what, and they tell him the contact will recognize him by a yacht pin they'll give him to wear. When they meet, he'll get the ding fod and give the other guy an envelope with $30,000. With that, it's time to take his pill and power up. We got sick of seeing that real quick, too. Every time he takes a pill, you have to watch at least part of it. Hey, you have to fill the runtime with something. Ideas sure aren't going to do it. I better tell Hal I'm leaving. <laughs> 200 million Americans and the pill only works on him. Well, it's a step up, Holly. Definitely a step up. Yes, I know. The first one only worked on a monkey. In case you haven't already figured out, Trent is the fall guy. He tries to be the one voice of reason in the asylum and always gets the short end as a result. Now? Yeah. I have to go someplace. I'll be back in an hour, okay? Okay. <laughs> Hal thinks maybe he's been inhaling too much motor oil. That was a decent gag, I'll admit. That's one in a row. Stanley wears a reversible coat that's sort of a heat shield, and when he takes off, it happens like this. I wish he wouldn't do that. <laughs> Fall Guy, remember? His job is to stand there and watch the whole thing and not move out of the way, even though he knows what's going to happen. This is called comedy. As we finish the credits, we see how he flies. So he has to have the jacket with the wings? That's one of many things that was never explained. If the pill gives him the ability to fly, why does he need the wings on the coat? Why does he need to flap his arms at all? You get the feeling we're going after over-the-top humor here, and it doesn't work. And while I couldn't put it in those terms in 1967, I could verbalize that they were trying too hard and it came out stupid. This is the guy he's supposed to meet, and that's the gadget we're after. The power paralyzer can stop any machine, and a couple of Russian spies outside the bathroom door want it back. He slips it into a box of matches to hide it. Stanley gets on the train, and the hijinks ensue. Good comedy requires that Stanley show the yacht pin to everyone except the guy he's supposed to contact. We get the contact passing the matches to Stanley, the Russian woman faints in his arms to keep him from seeing her partner grab the other guy, and Stanley gets the wrong contact and buys a $30 doll for $30,000. At headquarters, they can't figure out what kind of hidden message might be in this doll. I want to know what the salesman thought when he opened the envelope. The spies have realized Petrov must have passed the power paralyzer to someone and Stanley is the only candidate. Lucky for them, Stanley told the woman his entire life story while he was keeping her from fainting, so she knows where to find him. She can't talk the matchbox away from him, so she tries a different tactic. Authentic apartment you have. Come here, darling. Tell me all about yourself. Oh, well, to begin with, I was born July 17, 1939. I was a tiny baby for my size. Four pounds, three ounces. Uh, I was in an incubator for eight days. That didn't work. I have a great time. After the handball game, I... Stanley and Hal learn at the same time that her name is Mala. Hal is the stereotype ladies' man, so of course he thinks a beautiful woman like Mala should be with him, not Stanley, and he starts trying to sweet-talk her. She's completely cold until Stanley gives the matchbox to him. Then suddenly she wants Stanley to go change, and as quick as he's out of the room, she puts the moves on Hal and lures him outside, where the other spy is ready to knock him out so they can drive away with him. Just then, Reed calls. Mr. Reed, listen, I can't talk right now. I lost something. <laughs> Stanley, we're double-checking. Our man in Boston gave us a description of Petrov. A small man, thick glasses, round face, small gray cap, uh, no, Mr. Reed, that was the man who asked me for a match.
Nice you get him a description of the guy after the mission. Stanley realizes the power paralyzer is probably in the matchbox and now Hal is in danger. He tracks him to a warehouse. We get the requisite display of strength, followed by the requisite posturing, followed by the requisite loss of power. For some reason, Stanley can't just keep up the pretense and scare him into surrendering. He has to let everybody know he's not Mr. Terrific anymore and they can beat him to a pulp any time they want. Now he and Hal are both tied up, there's a bomb going off in five minutes, and Stanley can't get to his other backup pill. Stanley goes through a bunch of contortions to dump the pill out of his pocket. Come back here, you! Naturally he can't catch it, and naturally it's heading for a drain. That is the world's worst grate. Anybody can fall right through it. We have to watch this again, whereupon he shoots out of there, gets rid of the bomb, catches the bad guys, and saves the day. And we, Harley, our glorious country, is the only one that possesses Petrov's portable power paralyzer. May I have it, my boy? Yes, sir. <laughs> Well, at least they don't have it. To be blunt, the humor is juvenile. This is a show for kids, not for the family. Batman had stupid jokes, yes, but they were adult-level stupid jokes. The producers of this show don't seem to grasp that, so they aimed low. And they definitely hit it. Time to change the channel. Over in Big Town, police chemist Carter Nash is walking home from work while he narrates what kind of city this is. We have some early police squad type gags going on behind him with a laugh track that's practically non-stop. Hey, it's funny that all these people are getting hurt while a guy from the police is completely oblivious to all the violent crime going on around him. What? It's funny, don't you see? He's wearing glasses that only allow him to see directly in front of him, which is why he finally sees this. These guys are planning a bank robbery. He was, huh? We can't knock off the First National Bank. Why not? Savings are out there. These are the jokes, folks. Feel free to laugh anytime. Or not. I've been working on this job for two years. It's now or never. But what's the plan, boss? The first guard comes on in five minutes to make an outside check. You smash him over the head with this pipe. I'll take care of the dynamite. When the second guard comes on at midnight, you jump him and knock him out. If anyone else gets in you, or use your guns or your knives. But remember one thing. What's that? No violence. Too bad for them that the guy who just overheard them is really Big Town's superhero protector, Captain Nice. He springs into action. up his coat and then springs into action. He puts shoe trees in his shoes, hangs up his coat, and then springs into action. He loosens his tie, puts shoe trees in his shoes, hangs up his coat, and then springs into action. <laughs> and there's the payoff. He flies like his brain is going one way and his body is going another. These are the jokes, folks. Feel free to laugh anytime. Captain Nice confronts the criminals. Give me a dynamite, stop him. Give me a light. Well now, let's see how you like it. My mistake. like an eagle. It's the man with the muscles of lead. It's the masked enemy of all evil. Are you kidding? It's some nut in his underwear. <laughs> That's no ordinary nut, son. That's Captain Nice. We're immediately swept into the theme song, which thankfully doesn't tell his entire life story like the other one. It's the man who flies around like an eagle. Look, it's the enemy of all. That's illegal. Look at the muscles on those arms. They're like hammers. Look, 
if so not who walks around in pajamas? That's no nut boy. That's Captain Nice. Nice? Nice, 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 nice! Short and sweet. Much better. And I admit, as a kid, every time I heard that line about pajamas, I laughed. Sometimes I still do. This takes us into Captain Nice's origin story. Don't go. I've got to hurry, Mother. You know that experiment I've been working on in the lab? I think I'll be able to finish it today. Don't forget your briefcase. Okay. Don't forget your raincoat. Oh, but Mother... It's going to rain. But it's a nice sunny day. Carter, have I ever been wrong? <laughs> so long, Dad. Up. Down. There is a lot packed into this scene. Let's unpack it a little. First and foremost, Alice Ghostly is obviously going to be the real star of the show. Second, Carter is a total mama's boy. That's good because he's a tad forgetful if the briefcase is any indication. He has a big experiment going on and he's eager to get to it, even to the point of quasi-defying his mother. She always gets the last laugh, though, and she's never wrong. We also see that Carter has a dad, sort of. Spoiler, we never see his face. He's always behind that newspaper. How he even managed to create Carter, I don't want to speculate. And those are actually some decent jokes. I hope we can continue that trend. At HQ, we get a montage of Carter doing all kinds of weird science-y stuff, complete with test tubes and Bunsen burners and beakers and Bunsen honeydews and what have you, until... I've done it. I've done it! Done what? Oh, gentlemen, this is a really exciting moment for me. You get to the point. Yeah, we're very busy. I'm sorry, sir. It's just that what I have here can be so important. It had better be, Mr. Nash. Please bear in mind that I am the mayor of this town, and I've got a hundred pressing duties. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, get to the point isn't in Carter's vocabulary. He decides to demonstrate. He gives a mouse a drop of his formula, then turns it loose in a cage with a cat. <laughs> Gentlemen, that's it. That's it? Yes, sir. Do you realize what I have done? I certainly do. Why, you've created the world's most dangerous mouse. Carter just cannot get to the bottom line and say something like power formula or super strength formula, and he won't get the chance because just then they're interrupted. He's broken jail. Wait a minute. Don't tell me Omnis has escaped. Omnis has escaped. I asked you not to tell me that. That is one of about a thousand jokes recycled from Get Smart that we're going to have to endure. This show came from a lot of the same people who made Get Smart, and if they'd had more time, they might have come up with something comparable in quality. But this show is just slapped together and it shows. Anyway, Omnis is a master of disguise. He can be anyone or anything. He has at various times disguised himself as a painting, the fine arts museum caper, a large dog, the kennel club robbery, and once a piece of furniture. Furniture? I believe it was a chair. A Morris chair. <laughs> he remained at the scene of the crime during our entire investigation. I sat in him myself. You know, up to this point, despite the occasional recycled joke, this isn't bad. I sat in him myself is the kind of line I might expect out of Commissioner Gordon or Chief O'Hara. Definitely O'Hara. So if we keep things up to this level, maybe the show really could be a decent rival to Batman. What else do we know about him? Well, I can tell you one thing. What's that? He's extremely comfortable. <laughs> oh, well. But, sir, huh? what about this? What about it? Well, I think it's tremendously important. You do, eh? Why? Well, can you imagine what would happen if I drank it? You'd beat up a pussy cat? <laughs> Carter just never gets to the point. We learn that the main reason he's employed there is because the mayor is his uncle, and his uncle is terrified of his mother. Ironic setup for him to become a reluctant superhero, nearly complete. Time to meet the object of his repressed desires. Oh, Sergeant Kane. Hi. Hi. Everyone's looking for that ominous character. They think he's still in the building. Uh, yes. I was just leaving and I... I'll be right with you. Right. <laughs> what 
What's that? Oh, just something I've been working on. Shall we walk across the park? Uh, do we have to? You're not afraid, are you? I'll be perfectly honest with you. Uh, when I was a little kid, I was afraid of the dark. Oh, every little kid's afraid of the dark. During the day? <laughs> well, it's just that you are very sensitive. This is Anne Prentice, younger sister of established actress Paula Prentice. It was her first time as a regular on a show, poor thing. You can see she's trying, but she has almost nothing to work with. You know, we have known each other for almost a year. Why is it you never call me by my name? Is it the uniform? Oh, no. Uh, then please, call me Candy. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, her name is Candy Kane. So much for not going with the juvenile humor. This is going to be another kid's show, isn't it? Mr. Omnis, I presume. He's a master of disguise and nobody would think to check those things. He watched the demonstration and he understands the implications of Carter's formula. Now he's after it. In the park, Candy is really trying to come on to Carter and he keeps explaining how ordinary he is and why there's no good reason for her to be attracted to him. He says for a while his father couldn't remember his name and called him Spot. That I can believe. What about girls? What do you mean? Girls. You know, girls. I haven't had much luck with them, uh, to tell you the truth. Anyway, I really don't have much time for them, uh, with my research and all. Well, certainly you must think about them. I try not to. I try to think of girls as sort of round men. She draws him close, then says she's going to close her eyes. She's inviting him to kiss her, obviously. Not quite as obviously, that statue behind him is really ominous. He bonks Carter on the head, some henchmen drag him away, and they try to get his briefcase to get the potion. Give me that briefcase! Gregory Omnis! Take her to the truck. I think that was more than just a kiss. He gets ready to pour the formula out so Omnis can't get it when he hears Candy screaming for help again. Sergeant. Mystery Man comes in, beats up all the bad guys except Omnis, who gets away, and rescues Sergeant Kane. Say, mister, who are you? Some kind of a super person? What do you mean? Well, them muscles in a colorful costume. White underwear and a shredded raincoat equal a colorful costume. I gotta remember that. And them incredible deeds of skill and daring. Just wait till the newspapermen hear about it. Newspapermen? Well, sure. They're going to be here in a minute with them cops. Oh, well, uh, listen, would you please take care of the sergeant? Oh, well, you, you can't leave yet. What did I tell them? Please, would you let go of my colorful costume? <laughs> Wait, look at it. Look at that. Isn't that marvelous? Look at that buckle. What? What? Oh, C.N. Those are your initials, sir. What does she stand for? Huh? Look, I'm sorry, but, but it's getting late. And I'm due at another attempted criminal act. <laughs> We need to get a hold of you again. Who should we ask for? Ask for? Uh, yeah, well, ask for, uh, Captain Nice. <laughs> Captain Nice. That's right. Captain Nice. And there it is. His mother is thrilled. Man, you're, you're... Captain Nice. Captain Nice. Why Captain Nice? Why not? Why not? Wonder Man or Muscle Head, something like that. She gets ready to sew him a costume, and he gets ready to make more formula. Omnis is still out there. 
Nobody cares. That's the end of the episode. By now it was 9 p.m. 8 central time and we had concluded our first look at Batman's two rivals. We knew right away that Batman had nothing to worry about. Some of my friends gave up on both of them right then. A couple said Mr. Terrific was okay and they'd keep watching, but Captain Nice was stupid. Some others said just the opposite. I said, I'll keep watching because I want to see how stupid they can get. I always took a perverse pleasure in watching otherwise intelligent people make complete fools of themselves in public. I hope you do too because there's going to be plenty of it for us to make fun of. So stick around and let's make fun of them together. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.